Okay, so I've been using the Pixel 7 Pro since it dropped back in October 2022, and needless to say, I love this thing. It's in no way a perfect phone, and that should go without saying, but when it comes to Google's track record with the Pixel, well, this is more like it. It's honestly what the 6 Pro should have been, but hey, it's growing pains, and to me, these phones have come a long way. Now it's pretty clear to see that Google is putting in work to get the Pixel to be even more of a household name, and I think it's working. Adding on to its ecosystem, a partnership with the NBA, better marketing, good and fair pricing, all of this has contributed to the 6A, 7, and 7 Pro being crowned as Google's best-selling phones so far. Of course, relatively speaking, those sales numbers still have a long way to go, but for Google, this is a win I'm sure they'll gladly take. I'm seeing Pixel phones in the wild more often than ever before, and whenever smartphones come up in conversation, pretty much everyone knows about them and that they have great cameras. I remember a few years ago, I sat next to a lady on a plane who was using the Pixel 3 XL. I know y'all remember that notch. Whew. Anyway, I remember not being able to help myself but to ask her about it, and man, she lit up and gushed about the thing. She said she loved the software and the fluidity, she liked the quality of the display, and of course, she absolutely adored the cameras. I also had to ask her if she was bothered by that notch, and she said not at all. While I was a bit surprised by that, it made sense to me. The everyday consumer does not always care about the same things us tech enthusiasts make big deals out of, and that's kind of what this phone is all about. I've been satisfied with the 7 Pro's hardware. It's a big phone, it's even taller than the iPhone 14 Pro Max, but it's more narrow, making it pretty comfortable to hang on to and use. It's not as premium feeling as the 14 Pro's or the S23 Ultra, but it is still solid and it doesn't feel cheap. The buttons are nice and clicky and they're placed in a good spot. I normally prefer volume and power buttons to be on opposite sides, but this orientation makes way more sense than what the S23 Ultra has, where the volume buttons are above the power button nearing the top of the phone. I really dig the camera visor too. Personally, I like the look better than the 6's, and I think it gives the Pixel a true identity. Like when you spot it, you know instantly that the phone you're looking at is the Pixel. The curved display is nice to look at. I know some people have and still do clown the display for not being the newest or the bestest or whatever, and sure, it isn't the best panel out there, but it's still quite nice and crisp, it's colorful, it's very smooth, and it gets decently bright enough to use outdoors. Uh, personally, I've never really had an issue with it in terms of quality. Now, speaking of the hardware and the display, the 7 and the 7 Pro remind me of the OnePlus 7T and the 7 Pro, and how the 7 Pro was the better phone, but in many instances, I actually preferred using the 7T because of its narrower build and flat display. The Pixel 6a and 7 are still two of my most favorite phones to hold, and I think it's time for the Pixel Pro to drop the curved display. What do you think? Speaking of Pixel and drop, I have yet to drop my Pixel, and that's thanks to dbrand's grip case. Seriously, this is my go-to case, especially when traveling. dbrand's been supporting the channel for a long time, and they have the best skins in the game, so make sure you check them out along with their grip cases and other accessories using the very first link below. Thanks to dbrand for sponsoring this video. Luckily enough, my 7 Pro's camera glass hasn't shattered. That was me knocking on wood. If you don't know what I'm talking about, a number of reports came out about the camera glass randomly shattering without the user dropping or bumping the phone. Now this is pretty alarming as it does cause a tiny bit of paranoia as a 7 and 7 Pro owner myself. While it took some time, Google slowly began acknowledging the issue and its existence. I've got a link in the description to an article which follows the issue in real time and some of the users affected by it if you want a deeper dive. It's good that this doesn't appear to be a super widespread issue. All right, now full disclosure, I've used the 7 Pro for about four out of the five months it's been out. Back in January, I switched over to the OnePlus 11 to start my review process for that phone, but I still used the 7 Pro as my secondary, and over the past few weeks as of this video, the 7 Pro has been back as my main. Over time, performance has been really good. I'm not gonna lie though, I did run into my fair share of issues. Early on, 4K video would freeze while recording, cell signal would occasionally drop, Wi-Fi signal would drop randomly too, and I've had it happen where a couple of apps would just lock up and I'd have to close them, when in 1440p, YouTube wouldn't rotate properly until I did it manually and then auto-rotate would work. But I'm happy to say that all of these issues got fixed with updates and I haven't experienced them since I first got the phone. I'm especially glad about the cell and Wi-Fi fixes. The phone does get warm even during basic multitasking, but I haven't experienced any significant overheating and overall, speed and performance hasn't been much of an issue. Things have been smooth and pretty much lag-free and it's been able to handle everything I've put it through and yes, you can run games on here just fine. 
Now that brings me to this phone's processor, the Tensor G2. I've seen a number of reviewers, writers, and tweeters completely destroy this chip, talking about how underpowered it is and how inefficient it is and how you should avoid this phone at all costs because of it. I mean, sure, you probably don't want to get this phone if you're an extreme hardcore Alpha Boost 2000 Turbo Gamer. And there's nothing wrong with using benchmarks as a metric in general. But a lot of us get so caught up in these stats and numbers and to me, when that happens, you begin to miss the point of these phones in the first place when numbers are used on their own to determine determine whether or not a phone is good. They only tell part of the story. Now don't get it twisted. Yes, this processor is not on the super high end when it comes to power and efficiency. It's honestly closer to a mid-ranger in that regard. So I'm not going to pretend that Google doesn't need to step it up a bit here, especially with how much they're charging for this phone. But if you look at the Pixel 6 Pro, for example, that phone got better with age due to how the hardware worked in tandem with updated and refined software. And to this day, that phone still runs great and better than ever. Now, if in in just a few years from now, I report back saying, bro, the Pixel 6 and 7 are complete toast, these things do not run well at all anymore, then we'd have a problem. Google's main priorities with these Tensor chips are software, AI, machine learning, and optimization. So that's up to you to decide if that works for you. Battery life has been very good for me as well. Things have leveled out pretty nicely over time and I can easily get 7 hours of screen on time on a single charge with normal everyday use. Super heavy use sees me getting anywhere between 5.5 to 6.5 hours and I've even gotten up to 9 and sometimes 10 hours with very light casual use. Now I haven't been able to stretch the battery too much over 24 hours on a charge, so it's not a 2 day phone like the OnePlus 11 and S23 Ultra. I could use the extreme battery saving mode to help, but all in all, it's been reliable. Standby times are decent. Of course, your mileage may vary and different users are going to see different results. Wireless charging is nice to have, but the slow wired charging speeds have been just a little bit annoying. Especially when I was on the OnePlus 11, charging the phone from 0 to 100% in half an hour is so good. It takes my 7 Pro over three times as long to fully charge. It's not the end of the world, and I do appreciate adaptive charging which helps with battery health over time. I guess it's also not the worst thing since battery life is reliable, so I'm really mostly charging when I go to bed anyway. But still, I hope that this is the last time we see a Pro Pixel device with 20 watt charging. Anyway, the haptics here are still some of the best you'll find in a smartphone. Uh, the speakers are fine, though I feel they took a step back from the 6 Pro speakers. My ears are definitely not those of an audio engineer, and I kind of liked the almost muddiness of the low end of the 6 Pro speakers, something that's been dialed back this time around, resulting in the speakers not sounding as full. I don't know. I'm not a pro, so I don't actually know what I'm talking about. They're perhaps better balanced, but like I said, they're fine. The in-display fingerprint scanner is fine too. It's better than the 6s, but still not great. I've consistently experienced inconsistency. At least once a day, the scanner will act as if it forgot what fingerprints are, and it just says, you know what, forget it. I'm not doing this. Enter your code. So I'm hoping that this year's pixels get vastly improved scanners because it's desperately needed. Face unlock has been quick and accurate though, which is nice. It's not the most secure thing in the world, but it's convenient and I'm glad it's back. Oh, and the phone works well as as a phone because, you know, that's important and other than those signal issues, calls are clear on both ends, signal has been fine, nothing for me to really complain about here. Now when it comes to the software, this is obviously one of, if not the biggest selling point of Pixel devices. Android 13 has been a night and day difference compared to what we had with Android 12 on the Sixel. <laughs> Uh, I did it again, the Sixels, stop. Oh my gosh. Android 13 has been a night and day difference compared to what we had with Android 12 on the Pixel 6s. Aside from the squashed bugs mentioned earlier, things have been pretty smooth sailing and it's always nice to get regular updates. But I did run into an issue that many others did where I was stuck on the December update throughout the entirety of January. I had to toss an unactivated Verizon SIM in the phone just for it to be able to grab the update. It was an easy fix, but one I didn't really enjoy having to deal with. I would like to see Google step up their long term up game. Up game? Oh my gosh. I would like to see Google step up their long-term update game too. Samsung still holds the pole position on this one, with a promise of 4 years of OS updates and 5 years of security patches. OnePlus has made a splash by actually matching that same commitment. 2022's pixels are slated to only get 3 years of OS updates and 5 years of security patches, so take that for what you will. Now the smarts of the software is where this phone shines. 
you gotta love this collection of quality of life features, some of which you end up missing when using a different device. Some standouts for me have been Magic Eraser, which has been nice to have on hand, even though that's not really exclusive to the Pixel anymore. Um, I really like the ability to copy and save and share stuff while in the recent apps page. All of the call features have been great, and I actually think that some of these are coming to some of the older Pixel A phones, which is cool. Though call screening by now, in my experience, about 8 out of 10 callers just hang up before leaving a message. Copying and editing text is easier than ever, but what stood out to me the most was real-time transcriptions for voice recordings. Over the holiday season, I recorded a portion of a really cool conversation some of us had with my grandfather, and now I can go back and read the transcripts from that moment, and minus a few slip-ups here and there, it transcribed that conversation beautifully. The cameras are another area this phone shines in. You already know that though, and I mean, come on, this is what makes the Pixel the Pixel. This isn't a perfect set of cameras, there's still plenty of room for improvement, but this remains a very reliable and consistent point and shoot camera array. I can snap pictures with confidence, having a very good idea of what the results will show, and I know that darker skin tones will be taken care of properly more often than with other cameras. Video quality and audio and video recordings still need improvement for sure, but quality has gotten better. Stable Stabilization is really good, and it's cool to see things like cinematic video being added, which also needs improving. So Google, work on those things, add pro modes to your, you know, pro phone, because yeah, and that'll be a big step forward. I recently took the 7 Pro with me to a Mavericks game. Shout out to Google and Team Pixel for those tickets, much appreciated. I got to see LeBron James play in person for the first time, so that was really dope, especially with it being against his old running mate, Kyrie Irving. It was an interesting yet entertaining game, but the Mavericks did blow like a 26 point lead and the Lakers ended up winning. I'm getting completely off track, but the Pixel performed quite well, I gotta say. This was my vantage point, and I was able to get up close with Super Res Zoom and snapshots like these ones, where LeBron James and Luka Doncic, two all-time legends, were chatting it up, so that was really cool. But yeah, it goes without saying that these cameras are some of the absolute best, but competition is starting to heat up again, so we'll see what we get later this year. Anyway, out of the devices I currently own, these cameras are my favorite for capturing food. I mean, look, look at this. Doesn't this make you hungry? It's making me hungry, and I'm not even looking at the pictures right now, I just know which ones I'm putting up in the video at this point. I'll be right back. I'm going to go place a DoorDash order real quick. So I'm sure you saw that many media outlets and creators crowned the Pixel 7 as phone of the year for 2022. Now, whether you agree with that or not, you gotta admit that these are deserving of high praise. They're not flashy, they're not filled to the brim with bells and whistles, and they won't blow you away with crazy benchmark scores but they're not supposed to. The Pixel is a lifestyle phone, a great daily workflow companion. It's becoming a bigger household name. Everyone knows what an iPhone is. Everyone knows what a Galaxy is. The Pixel brand has crept its way into the mix a little bit. In my opinion, the 7 and 7 Pro were priced pretty perfectly already, but you can often find them on sale for $500 and $750 respectively. At that price, it's an easy recommendation for me to make. However, the Pixels are not the only game in town. This year is going to be big for phones, especially for ones well under $1,000. The Pixel 7a will be here soon, and I'm expecting that to be a big win in the budget to mid-range category, and the OnePlus 11 is a phone I'm actually a big fan of so far. Far. But I've really enjoyed my time with the 7 Pro, and if I wasn't a reviewer, I could easily continue to use this as my one and only phone indefinitely. Now what I really want to see is a Google Pixel Ultra, the highest of the high end that Google can possibly reach. All the power, all the specs, everything. It's time. Either way, I do recommend picking up the Pixel 7 Pro if you're able to grab one for that $750 price tag. It's clean, it's simple, it isn't a spec giant, but it does exactly what it's supposed to do, and then some. What do you think of the Pixel 7 Pro? Let's talk about it in the comments, and since you've made it to this point of the video, you are awesome, and I really appreciate you. Go ahead and drop an ice emoji for this icy white Pixel, and drop a potato if you're part of the potato gang. Hope you enjoyed. 
It's been Zach, and thank you so much for watching.